But we reviewed the gospel accounts according to Matthew, and we were looking part two of our series, and we were looking at specifically what's oftentimes called the Sermon on the Mount. And we didn't get through everything because it is quite long, but we had a lot of con a conversation around different aspects of the chapters we looked at, but we didn't spend a lot of time on the comment that Jesus made regarding our being salt. So I wanted to spend a few minutes digging down into that and having us to reflect upon what it means and what Jesus meant, because let's be honest and candid, when we review what's oftentimes referred to as the Sermon on the Mount, it is like rapid fire concepts coming at you. And in many cases, depending upon the gospel account you're reading, some get a little more detailed than others. Um, and when we look at it, we can just gloss over it. And each one of the points made are detailed, detailed studies for us in Bible study if we take the time. So I want to spend a few minutes going through that. If you turn over to Matthew chapter 5, that's where we were at when we were reading it last Sabbath. And it is in verse 13 where we read, You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its savor, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. Oftentimes, I think we miss some of the context simply because we come from a completely different culture, a different time altogether. And I'm sure in that particular world, and I say world from the standpoint of time, I think that probably the concept of salt had a little different meaning or more of a meaning, I should say, than what you and I think about. Obviously used for flavoring and preserving is, you know, even what we think of in, the, in, in our time now. But most salt that was in Israel came from the region known as the Dead Sea. And that salt, was full of impurities. And when we think about impurities within the salt, it caused it to actually lose some of its flavor from time to time. It's interesting, I did find this on, the, on a website regarding salt, and I didn't think about it. You know, the Arab people say oftentimes when they're having a, a, a conversation, they'll use the term, apparently this is something they use, called this is salt between us. The Persians in their culture, a different time, when they spoke of a person, they would say untrue to salt, or mean, meaning that these people were disloyal or ungrateful people. And that's all because of the fact that salt, even in those particular times of history, they were used for the purposes of preserving. And as a result of the qualities of salt that allowed foods to be uh, kept in good good uh, standing for a period of time, it was very, very highly esteemed. You know, I can remember speaking to my grandmother, who was born in rural North Carolina during the time of the Depression, and they didn't have even electricity and things of that nature. Um, and I remember her telling me as a young kid many times about how they had ice boxes instead. In fact, she would oftentimes refer to the refrigerator as the ice box. And it was literally a box that had ice in it. It was the only thing that kept them where it would be able to preserve food. But she also referenced that they used a lot of salt. And of course, being very, very poor and having a lot of salt led to her having a lot of problems with blood pressure issues later in life. Because even in her later stages, she would pour the salt on everything. And I'm like, Grandma, you don't need to be doing that. That's not good. But that was what her taste buds had gotten used to as a part of the culture she grew up in. I've also found it interesting that the word salt comes from the Latin term salarium, which is the word that we get in English for salary. In fact, in Roman times, the times when uh, Jesus would have been referencing this, Many times soldiers were paid in salt. 
they were, you know, we know they were paid in denarius, they were paid in different coins, but they were also paid like we have had a barter system over the course of time. They also were paid in salt and that's how much value was put on salt. And many times the Greek would use the term with slaves who did not perform very well. They coined the expression that a person wasn't worth his salt. And that's what we have in our, in our language today where we hear that a person's not worth their salt, meaning the value, they're not worth the value. So, you know, you think of all of these different views throughout history and the time that Jesus gave this, what Jesus is also making reference here is that salt was of high, a highly valued commodity of the time. And, you know, when we think about salt today, we don't think probably very much about it, to be candid with you. But to be compared to salt was to mean at that time you were being compared to something very, very valuable. Very valuable. And something that I think just flies right over our head when we read the analogy that Jesus is giving at the time. Now, each one of the gospel accounts have some aspects about this. Let's turn over to Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14 gives us a little different insight into this particular comment that's made by Jesus and using the metaphor of salt. And in Luke chapter 14, we'll look in verse 34. It makes the comment, he says, salt is good, but if salt loses its savor, what will it be seasoned? It is fit for neither the soil nor the manure pile, and it is thrown out. He who has an ear, let him hear. And when we think about this, we see that useless salt was thrown out because it no longer had the value that was associated with it. And he's, he's telling his disciples, because this particular going all the way up to verse 25, the context of Jesus speaking here is speaking to his disciples. And he's telling his disciples, we consider ourselves disciples of Jesus today, that if they didn't continue to be good and be valuable, then they would be useless. They would not be worth anything, not to even be put in the ground and not to even be uh, utilized in any way. And of course, the utilization of salt is where it gets its value. And hence the reason why you and I should focus on, are we usable by God? Are we usable by Jesus Christ? Kind of is, it gives an allusion towards the concept that Jesus would make later regarding an individual who puts their, their, their as we say, their shoulder to the plow and then decides to turn back from it. Once they accept the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, for the sins and then turn back on that. And then there's no more sacrifices we see in the book of Hebrews. Something for us to think about regarding ourselves. Now let's turn over to Mark and let's see what Mark says about another component of value and another idea regarding salt. Mark chapter nine and verse 49, we see here something different, something new that's kind of interjected into the concept of salt and the metaphor regarding us that Jesus is using his disciples. Verse 49 says, for anyone, for, or rather everyone rather should say, will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, with what will you season it? Have salt among yourselves and be at peace with one another. We see two concepts here. We see the concept of salt and we see it being associated with fire. And we see that eventually everyone, not just even the disciples of Jesus Christ, but ultimately everyone will be salted with fire. And of course we can draw some parallels to that regarding sufferings. And when we think about sufferings, we think about temptations and trials. Temptations and trials are not easy. We don't like them when we're in them, 
Someone that says they love temptations and trials are probably not very wise. Yet at the same time, we know that they work good for us. As the Apostle Paul says, all things work good. And the things that God will allow, as he did with Job, certainly he was not joyful with boils all over him. But look what it did with his faith. And you and I can go through our own fire and we'll all be salted. We'll all go through sufferings and we all go through, as Jesus says, much tribulation before we enter into the kingdom of God. And so as a result of that, whether someone may think that someone's getting away with something today, eventually everyone, everyone will be salted with fire. But we also see something else here in Mark that's not listed in Matthew, not listed in Luke. And that is the concept of salt being among yourselves and to be at peace with one another. There's an element here of peace associated with salt. And we see that the peace, or we'll see in a few minutes, that it's, that it's a characteristic that other cultures have picked up on in the course of time as well, that we probably in our culture have has allowed to do, disintegrate. You know, I go back to the Greek concept, and of course, not in any way advocating slavery, but you and I understand that the Apostle Paul utilizes the fact that he was a slave for Christ or a servant. And a servant with uh, it's not worth their salt was a useless servant. You and I are not to be useless and we are to have salt among ourselves and we are to be at peace with one another. It affects relationships, not only our relationship with our heavenly father and Jesus Christ, but relationships among each other. And of course, you know, when we think about it, um, that the concept is 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 an aspect of the discipleship of being in allegiance with Jesus Christ and with going forward to as the gospel commission is and Matthew tells us to go and make disciples of others when God allows and when God calls we're not the ones because no one can come to the father except or come to Jesus except through the father and as the father calls but we can be utilized as a tool to help the process if we have salt about ourselves. You know, if we want our life and our relationship to count, then there's aspects that I think with salt, as we've seen so far in scripture, that you and I should learn and should emulate and should be a part of us. You know, when we think about the qualities of salt that are found in salt characteristics, they reflect some of these things. It's a physical component. And as everything is with an analogy, as everything is with a metaphor, we know there's certain parts that it breaks down, but it is something that Jesus used in that air quotes, Sermon on the Mount, to inject a concept within his disciples that he wanted his disciples to think about, consider about themselves and about their interactions with other people. And, of course, their interactions with him and with, G with the Father. When we think about some of these qualities, I have it listed here. Um, some things for us to consider. You don't necessarily have to turn to all of these scriptures. But we see in Job 6.6, 6, there is the taste factor. In fact, Job 6.6 6 says, is tasteless food eaten without salt? Or is there flavor in the white of an egg? And of course, Job is considering the temptations and the trials that he's going through. Satan is tempting him to reject God. And he's going through a very difficult time in his life, uncomfortable time, physically, which is having a, an effect on him spiritually. And of course, we know at the end, he will have a, a conversation with the God of the Old Testament, Jesus Christ. And as a result of the physical uncomfortableness that he endures, he will reach a point where he will say that he now sees God, sees him and sees himself in the right light, in the right way. Would like for us to turn over to Leviticus chapter two.
find it interesting that salt is listed in Leviticus chapter 2 in reference to different sacrifices that were made at the altar. Now, again, you and I today, we don't have an alt a, a bronze altar back here. We're not offering up animals. We're not offering up anything like that as a result of the times. But it is interesting in Leviticus chapter 2, verse 13. And this is with the grain offerings. It says, and you shall season each of your grain offerings with salt. And you must not leave the salt of the covenant of the Lord your God out of your grain offerings. You are to add salt to each of your offerings. Two things there. You and I are to be living sacrifices, as the Apostle Paul says in Romans 12. We're not doing physical sacrifices, although we physically sacrifice things in our lives. That makes us a living sacrifice, which is our reasonable service and the way that we worship God. And our worship is not just something we do on the Sabbath. Our worship is every day. And everything we do. And you and I think, or at least it appears in Scripture, that we are of the first fruits. And we see in the first fruits the, the combination with what is listed on the day of Pentecost, the harvesting of the first fruits. And of course, we see the first fruit being in the wave sheep offering of Jesus Christ. And these grain offerings. And the grain offerings of the wheat was a grain offering of the first fruits of the ground is with salt. Salt is a part of this, which very much connects to what Jesus is referencing to his disciples. And notice that he says, you must not leave the salt of the covenant of your Lord. I kind of thought Bill was going to get into that covenant of salt when he gave his message the other day, because there is a covenant of salt. And we'll look at that a little bit in the in the New Testament in just a moment. But, you know, we, we enter into a covenant with God. And in the New Testament, we reference that as a covenant of faith. But, you know, that is a covenant relationship that, yes, is collective as the church, but it's individual, like Bill was referencing with us individually. We make a covenant when we are baptized. We make a covenant, an arrangement, and an agreement. You know, I find it interesting, I don't want to get too political here, but just like this whole idea of student loan debt, forgiveness. Now, we understand we're, yes, forgiven for our sins, and we don't earn it, and, and, and I get all of that. But the understanding that I want us to draw from in this is that when we enter into this covenant arrangement, we have pretty much signed on a dotted line figuratively of our commitment of our lives what we will live by, what we will do. And it is very important that we understand that this covenant includes within it salt. We are to live a life that provides a preserving factor. We are to live a life that, yes, is, is a very tasty and savior way with a relationship with our Heavenly Father. And we are to be tasty and or easy to get along with in our relationships with others. And that is to be a part of every offering, every offering that we have. I have here a reference to Ezekiel 43, 24. I won't ask you to turn there. I'll read to you. In verse 22 of Ezekiel 43, it says, And on the second day, you are to present an unblemished male goat, as a sin offering, which we know Jesus Christ is a sin offering, and the altar to be cleansed as it was with the bull, and even you, or, or rather when you, have finished the purification, you are to present a young unblemished bull and an unblemished ram from the flock. You must present them before the Lord. The priest shall sprinkle salt on them and sacrifice them as a burnt offering to the Lord. We are disciples of Jesus Christ, and he tells us to be the salt of the earth because he was the salt of the earth. And his great sacrifice provides preservation for us when we enter into that covenant arrangement. And that covenant arrangement includes the salt that we are to be and the commitment that we are to be as well.
While we're here in Leviticus, let's just turn over to Numbers chapter 18, just a few pages over. Numbers chapter 18 and verse 19. Here we see all of the holy offerings that the Israelites present to the Lord, I give to you and to your sons and daughters as a permanent statute. It is a permanent covenant of salt before the Lord, you and your offering offsprings. When you really think about it, the covenant we enter into at baptism is also a covenant of salt. I don't know if you've thought about that, but it is. And it can be many different things, but I find it very interesting that the scriptures we're reading and looking at in the Old Testament, they're using salt and Jesus is using salt. And of course, there is the analogy, there is the metaphor of the qualities of salt and the utilization of salt. And there is parallels to what is to be within you and what is to be within me. Chronicles, or Second Chronicles uh, 13, verse 5, another, I think, interesting comment here is even with David. You know, David entered into a covenant as well. There's the Davianic covenant. Um, but it lists in verse 5 of that particular verse, do you not know that the Lord, the God of Israel, has given the kingship of Israel to David and his descendants forever by a covenant of salt? That is something that I don't think we think of a lot. I don't hear a lot in messages that I've listened to, whether it's in other church organizations or even in ours here that a lot of focus is put on the covenant of salt. And we see that there is a, a lineage of rulership and Jesus Christ was to come from the lineage of, G, of David. And he is the, the salt for which we have access to the Father. And we enter into a, an agreement and a covenant and that salt provides preservation as I said earlier for us as well as it, as it is to be something that we interact with other people with. I go back to what we read earlier regarding Mark 9 and verse 50. And in Mark 9 verse 50, um, we had it listed there that salt is good, but if salt loses its saltiness, with what will you season it? Have salt among yourselves and be at peace with one another. That being at peace with one another and salt among yourselves. I don't know how well you can see this, but this is something that I think is, is interesting. There's it's a symbol in Scandinavian countries that the value of salt uh, in the Middle Ages was highly um, gifted and prized. And it was a symbol of friendship and trust. Um, when you think about it, there is a friendship and there should be a trust among us, a friendship with our Heavenly Father, a friendship with Jesus Christ and a friendship among each other. And that's where we see the phrase, the, the salt of the earth reflect, the importance of how often it is to be used as a unifying, a unification of status. You know, when you think about it, you and I are to be salt and we are to have salt. And the apostle Paul will utilize the term of unification as the church being unified. And a lot of times that's been used in churches, I say, in my past, I know I've been a part of, as a way of control. But the way that it should be is that we're all seeking unification with Jesus Christ. And if we're all doing that, then we're all unified together. But if we're only unifying ourselves, then you know we're, we're, we may be unifying ourselves to something that isn't of God. So we have to be careful with that. There's two ways of of th how things can really get out of balance and two viewpoints that we need to keep in our minds at all times. And our symbolism of salt here in this case is something that you and I must focus on with our heavenly father in Jesus Christ, allow that to uh, permeate within ourselves, within our conversations, within our interactions with one another in the church and out of the church. You know, Jesus would also, in Matthew as well, right behind the salt, utilize the light and reference the fact that the light is not covered over with a bushel basket, but it gives its light out. In the same way, the salt isn't just in the church, 
the salt is to be spread among others as well as the commission of the gospel is to make disciples of all. So it is a spreading and going forth. And it's not something we just hoard and keep for ourselves. As I said, we, we consider the symbol of salt as in another way that the Apostle Paul gives us as well in Colossians. Turn over to Colossians chapter 4. We see here that there's an aspect that Paul gives that is still very consistent. And, and you think about, <clears throat> he's using this in reference to speech and actions. And he's using this to the, or giving this rather, should say, to the church at Colossia. And we'll just uh, go up to verse one. He says, Master, supply your slaves with what is right and fair, since you know that you have a master in heaven. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful, as pray, or you as you pray, also for us, that God may open to us a door to the word so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ, for I am in chains. Pray that I declare it clearly as I should. And then skipping down to verse 5, he's asking the church to also consider themselves. He says, act wisely towards outsiders, redeeming the time. So it's not just in the church, outsiders as well. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned, with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. You know, when we think about it, um, there's aspects that we need to think about with salt in the way we interact with people. Our words, our speech can turn people off or can be used by God to continue to navigate people towards God. And you and I have the ability if we have our, our words and our speech seasoned with salt, seasoned with preservation, seasoned with healing, seasoned with all of the, uh, the qualities that we've looked at salt that, are, that is good, so that we may know how to answer everyone. And, that, and there's, a, there's an implication given there that you don't answer everyone the same way. You, you answer everyone the same way in the light of the right way, but you may do it a different method depending upon the individual and what their needs are. You don't have a canned speech prepared. You let the Holy Spirit navigate if God's using you to say the words needed at that time for that individual. Kind of like Jesus said, don't think in advance what you're going to say when I put you before magistrates and judges. I will give you the words. Don't have it in your mind. Don't memorize it. Don't put it down on your cell phone. Well, let me just read to you what I'm going to tell to you now. No, let the Spirit lead you and guide you. And the same way is that what we're seeing here with the way our language should be and our speech should be. There is the aspect of salt and its healing properties as well. Um, and that goes back to 2 Kings uh, chapter 2. And if you look at 2 Kings chapter 2, you'll see that uh, Elisha was healing the waters at Jericho. I'll read that for you going into verse 19. It says, then the men of the city said to Elisha, please note, our Lord, that the city's location is good, as you can see, but the water is bad and the land is unfruitful. Bring me a, a new bowl, he replied, and put some salt in it. So they brought it to him, and Elisha went out to the spring, cast the salt into it, and this is what the Lord says, I have healed this water. No longer will it cause death or unfruitfulness. And the waters there will be healthy, to, have been healthy to this day, according to the words spoken by Elisha. You know, you think about that example. I realize it's a physical example, a physical miracle, a thing that happened, Yes, but think about the parallels from you and I. And if, if, if the Holy Spirit is to be living waters flowing from out as instruments of God, you and I need healing. And that healing comes from the salt and the covenant of salt that we enter into. And it's, it's, it's a very much, I think, similar to what we see here in this example in 2 Kings because <clears throat> 
we see that there's that just having water wasn't good enough. It had to be water that was going to be healing, have healing qualities to it so that it could then make things fruitful. And you and I, without that covenant of salt, are very similar to the water that was at Jericho. But when the salt and the covenant of salt enters into us, then we can produce the water with God's Holy Spirit that will provide fruit, fruits of the Spirit and fruits that are productive and utilized by God. So to wrap this up, we think about applications to life. You know, do we exhibit the qualities of salt? That's one question for you, one question for me. You know, we add, or do we add a better flavor to the life around us? You know, when we have friendships and or we have acquaintances with other individuals, do we bring value to the, the friendship? Do we bring value even to our relationship with Jesus Christ? Do we preserve God's name, God's character, God's peace, the knowledge of God's truths and God's ways when we're asked? We don't act like a megaphone and tell people, but when asked for a hope that lies within us, do we have that ability to, to provide that covenant of salt water? Do we heal? Do we bring Godly relationships to all that we come in contact with. You know, we can come in contact with some people who have gone through some very difficult times in their lives. And coming across as a more holier than thou can turn a lot of people off. Do we come across as real people? Individuals that are just real live people who can provide value even to those who are hurt. We may not physically be able to heal the miraculous healings that Jesus Christ performed, the Apostle.